Hi everyone, uh, today I want to talk once again about the monomorphism restriction. I've, I've done a previous video on the monomorphism restriction where I sort of introduce and explain it. Uh, this won't directly build on that, you don't need to go off and watch that first. Um, but uh, this came up in a, uh, a conversation a few weeks ago with my uh, my PhD thesis advisor, Stephanie Weirich. We were we meant to be talking about advanced, amazing researchy things, but we ended up getting stuck on a on a type inference puzzle um, that she had tried in class and that she it didn't it didn't type check and she couldn't quite figure out why and we had to stare at it for a while to figure it out. So I thought it would make a fun a fun video and it's all about the monomorphism restriction. Um, okay, so let's let's dive in. So um, this is going to center around a function from the random library um, uh, called uniform. Uh, so let's take a look at uniform. So I can get its type by doing this. I hope if I say this, I can actually do a little ghci command right in line. So there's the type of uniform. So we can keep that up in front of us. The idea here is that it is polymorphic both in the um, the the random generator and the um, uh, uh, the random type or the the type of the random value produced. Um, so the idea here is that we have two different class constraints on uniform. This will be important. Um, uh, and the first one is random gen G. So that means that G is some bit of information that we can use to uh, to run a, a random generator. Um, so a, a very good example of G is std gen, um, which comes from the random library. So I can get info about std gen uh, and so studgen is a type, and it's you know there's some internal uh, representation for it, but it has this random gen instance, and so and and there's actually a function, um, uh, um, I think it's mukstudgen, indeed that allows us to use some seed. Uh, to create a std, a std gen. So th this way I can create predictable pseudo random numbers. There's also a way of using the IO monad, for example, uh, uh, to generate one based on system time and things like that. You can look at the library for all the details. Um, but the, the important thing is, is that there's this type std gen and it has this random gen instance. So the idea is that one of these std gens, it has a whole bunch of bits in it, and then we can use those bits to produce pseudo random numbers and uh, uh, or pseudo random anything, it doesn't have to be numbers, of course, as long as there's a uniform instance for the type we want to produce. So whoops, let's take a look at uniform. So we can take a look at uniform. And this is a class. And it has a lot of instances, including one for int. So that's the one that we're going to look at. Um, uh, we might think, is, is there a uniform integer? Well, no, integer is unbounded. There's no way we can pluck any integer at random. I don't even know what that would mean. But int is bounded, so we can pluck one at random. And that's what we're going to do. Um, okay, let's clean some of this up. We don't need all of this in our nice file here. Um, we don't even need mukstudgen. We're not actually going to use it. Uh, but I just wanted to give you an idea of how we might actually do this. Um, and we don't need all of this stuff. We're going to keep the type of uniform. That's, that's going to be important. So here's the function that I want to write. I want to write random int which takes a std gen and it returns an int and then the new std gen. Um, uh, because maybe I want to call random int several times and each time I call random int, we're going to get a new std gen so I can use that to produce the next pseudo random number. Um, okay, so we have random int of g0, the initial one. And what is this going to be? Well, this is going to be the result n and then the next std gen where and g1 equals uniform of g0. And all is well. This program type checks. Hooray. Um, OK, so let's let's say I want to do a little bit more. Let's say I want to write a function add 5, um, which is just going to do what it says. So add 5 is going to just add 5. And I'm, I didn't bother to write a type signature for add 5. And now I want to do random int plus 5. So here, it's still going to have the same type as random int, but now I'm going to say n, uh, no, I'm not going to write n plus 5, I'm going to write add 5 of n and g1, where same definition as we had before, like this. Um, and 
all is well once again. Um, you're probably expecting some error to come up in this case. No, not yet. Soon, soon. Um, so one thing I'd like to point out. So here, add five has type int arrow int. If I comment out this definition down here, add five now suddenly has type integer arrow integer. So what's going on here? That's a bit strange. So what, what, what happens with the monomorphism restriction? So first off, we should say the monomorphism restriction is hitting add five. So the monomorphism restriction is going to change the type of any definition that has no type signature and whose type would ordinarily be uh, uh, and whose type would ordinarily be constrained and which doesn't look like a function. So here add five because I haven't written any arguments between the name of the function and the equal sign. It doesn't look like a function. And so that means that the GHC is going to try to monomorphize it. And so there's no restrictions on what add five should be. So it defaults the type of add five to integer arrow integer. When I have random int plus five, now we get add five has type int arrow int because it's used here. And GHC requires that add five be monomorphic. That's the monomorphism restriction. Um, and here, because we know that we're supposed to return an int, uh, random int plus five has to, whoops, uh, add five rather, has to have type int arrow int for this to type check, right? Integer and int are different types. Uh, you might want a subtype relationship between them or something, but we don't have any of that. They're just different types. Okay, um, so now things are going to get a little bit more interesting when I comment out the type signature. So right away, we run into trouble. Um, so let's look at what the trouble is. Uh, so I think I can do this with this key. Oh, ambiguous type variable A0 arising from a use of plus. So what this is basically saying is that we know it has to be something monomorphic. Please, please, please come up with a monomorphic type for add five but we don't know what. Um, and, and so we get this ambiguous type variable because we don't know what A0 should be. Um, so that's that one. And then down here, could not deduce uniform A0 arising from a use of uniform. Now, this is the more interesting one. I want to put this to the side for now. We will come back to this and explain it in just a little bit. So clearly, though, we can see that that uh, commenting out my type signature is just causing all manner of chaos. I don't want chaos. So let's bring it back. Um, but I do realize maybe I don't want chaos, but maybe I do want uh, this to be uh, polymorphic. I want this not to just work for int, but maybe for any type A. So I'm going to change this int to be A. And right away I get other errors. So here, couldn't match expected type A with actual type A0. Well, that's a bit strange. Um, but really what's going on here is that we need this add five to be monomorphic. And, and here it looks like it needs to be polymorphic if it's going to return any type A. So that means I clearly want to turn off the monomorphism restriction. I say clearly there, uh, only clearly after you've been doing a bunch of Haskell. If you didn't immediately jump to that conclusion, that, that does not mean that you don't know what's going on. Um, restriction, no monomorphism restriction. Okay, so we've disabled that. So now GHC will nicely uh, uh, generalize the type of A5, of add five here, and we get this nice polymorphic type, and we still have an error here, but now it's a much better error. No instance for num A. Oh, well, that makes very good sense. This should only work on numbers, so I'll say num A here. Um, oh, and now what? Could not deduce uniform A. Well, that also makes sense. I'm, I'm trying to, I'm going to do this uniform derivation. So it's not any number. Integer wouldn't work, for example. It has to be a uniform. So let me do that. Okay. So now this is all good. But you might have noticed something strange has happened up here. I wrote random int some time ago. I haven't changed anything. What's going wrong now? Ugh. Um, and if we look here at the error, now we get this ambiguous type variable A1 prevents the constraint uniform A1 from being solved. What on earth is going on here? So this right up here is, is the actual error that Stephanie ran into that took some time and effort to figure out what was going on. But it actually tells us in the error message something quite interesting. When checking that the inferred type G1, uh, I'm worried about moving my, oh no, it still works. Um, uh, G1 of this type is as general as its inferred signature, this. So 
that's really weird. It has its inferred type and an inferred signature. What's going on here? This is an opportunity for some error message improvement. But this is a weird type, right? Let's look, let's look at that type. Think about that for a moment. It's saying that G1 has type for all A, uniform A, but then A doesn't appear over here. So let's take a step back and I'm going to explain what is attempting or what GHC is attempting to do here and then things go very, very wrong. So this, in this where clause, I've defined two new variables, N and G1. I haven't given type signatures to either one. And so GHC must infer their types. So let's start with N. N is, N is the easier one here. So N is going to be the result uh, of this call to uniform. We can look at the type of uniform here. And so if N is going to be that result, it's going to have type A um, as long as A has, is, um, has a uniform uh, um, instance. And indeed, that's true. I can write that out. So this N has type uh, uniform, whoops, uniform A to A. And that's all well and good. That's really its type, right? I've called uniform on G0. But now we have to think, what is the type of G1? Well, if I look at this, this random gen G, that's not going to come into play here because I know everything is working over std gen. But this uniform A um, constraint still has to be there. And so we end up with this uniform A uh, gives us type std gen. That's really strange. It means that anytime I use G1, I'm going to have an ambiguous type. And indeed, up here, that's what we have. We have ambiguous type variable A1. Um, the reason I was getting the other error earlier was because it was trying to sort of essentially do an ambiguity check, and things went wrong, and we got a bad, a bad error. Um, but really, the problem is, is that GHC is inferring this too general type for G1. You might think, well, why does it even infer this uniform A constraint? Well, it does actually matter. The value of G1 is going to depend on what type we choose for A. And that's because if we imagine yanking a, an int out of this pseudo random generator, we might use some of its bits of randomness. But if we yank five ints from the pseudo random generator, we're going to yank more randomness. If more randomness doesn't make sense to you, we might imagine another uh, pseudo random number generator that, say, has a periodicity of a thousand. So every time, every thousand ints, it repeats. Um, and, and that might be useful for some testing scheme. Well, then. The choice of A, maybe A, instead of being a single int, is a tuple of five ints. That's going to change the result of G1. It needs to advance further in, in this period. So this really does have to be there. It's going to have a runtime effect. Of course, the problem is I don't want to generalize these types at all. But GHC doesn't know that. And so it does generalize the types. And it means that we end up with these weird, ambiguous types where we're not expecting them. The solution, at least in this case, is what I want to say is I want to say right here, the n has type int. And if I do that, and if uh, I enable scope type variables, um, then the problems go away. So let's get rid of these. These are now out of date. And everything is happy up here. And that's because I fixed this, this choice for, for, for int. Now, what's strange here, this choice for the type of n, I should say, what's strange here is that, of course, it looks like I should be able to infer the type of n from its use here at type int. But if n is more general than int, that's fine too. Remember, the old type that GHC inferred for n was for all a, a, essentially. And so it just specialized that type at its use site. So this is a bit unexpected. And here, it's where the monomorphism restriction is actually good. Right? When we had the monomorphism restriction, we knew GHC knew not to try to generalize, which is exactly what we meant. We didn't want it to generalize there. Um, OK, so now down here, it's still a little bit hard. Um, here I have to say n has type a, because I still want this to be polymorphic in a. That doesn't work because a isn't in scope. I have to manually bring it into scope with a for all a up here. And then now all is well again. Um, OK, so what have we seen here? So we've seen that sometimes when I write an equal sign, I want generalization. This add 5, I wanted this to be able to work on any type, including this locally quantified a down here that's local to random int plus 5. Um, so this, I wanted it to be generalized. 
But up here, I really didn't want these to be generalized. I wanted these to be monomorphic. And so maybe in some alternate universe, Haskell has two different equal signs, an equal sign that means, yes, generalize me, and another equal sign that says, no, please don't. Um, and that's kind of what we want here. Um, and, and so an upshot is, is that the monomorphism restriction is sometimes useful and sometimes annoying. And so we have to be careful how we operate. Um, I wish I had some grand advice of ways of avoiding these pitfalls. The problem is, is that sometimes we do want generalization, sometimes we don't. Um, and so we have to just think about it when we write equal signs, kind of like sometimes we want laziness, sometimes we want strictness, and so we have to think about it and, and operate accordingly. Um, anyway, I hope this has been interesting. Thanks very much for watching. Bye.